All right, welcome to our study on the book of 1 Corinthians. This is session 12, The Deep Things of God. We're going to go right back through this chapter again. We're going to start back in verse 7. We're going to start in verse 9. I know that you have part of this. There's a little bit of repetition right here at the beginning, and then we're going to, we're going to, okay. All right, so here we go. So, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things. See these things? Keep seeing these things, okay? The Spirit uh, uh, revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. When you see all things, doesn't that make you think there's more there than just the mystery? Okay, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from on that. It says, For what a man knoweth, the th- what, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So verse 9 begins with, as it is written. We're going to come to this at the end of the session today because there's a bit of a reveal there that I think is pretty exciting. So we'll look at that then. As you read the passage, notice all the references to all things that are in the verses. That continues on down through the chapter. I mean, this is just the passage that we're in right now. What are all things? Well, again, looking back at verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom. And so the things in verses 9 through 12 are specifically the things pertaining to the mystery. And, and, uh, and, and those things were revealed to Paul. Now, in other words, Paul's explaining how he got divine revelation. He starts off by saying, those things cannot be known by the wisdom of men. There's nothing you can do to figure that out. Only God can reveal those. So verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And again, the we is not every believer. The passage is about divine revelation and not every believer receives that. The we is Paul and those in the assemblies who are the grace apostles and prophets to whom God revealed the mystery. And so now Ephesians 3, and now here's where we begin to flesh things out. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That's the point I was making in the previous session. Paul gets it by direct revelation. How do we get it? By reading Paul. That's why it was so important for Paul to get that right. See, because if our understanding is based on what we read, then inspiration has to be a real thing. Verse 5, "...which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now..." And see, here comes the apostles and prophets. "...as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit." Does that make sense? Okay, so you see that. Okay, now... Uh, So I want to say something about this as kind of an aside because we're talking about the revelation of the mystery. For dispensationalists, and it took me a long time before I realized what a dirty word dispensationalism was. But people hate that word. And it's mostly because they have a doctrinal understanding that is not dispensational. I mean, I get that. Okay. But there are basically in most dispensational they're they're in three categories and there is the acts two position so i could put i'm not going to put it up on the board there's the acts two position that says on the day of pentecost that's one but actually under the acts two heading there are three different ideas about when the body of christ started and all of that and it all comes under the heading of acts two Then there is the mid-Acts position. And that also has three slightly different times. Now, I am mid-Acts. And so those three times are Acts 9. And we know what Acts 9 is. That's the conversion and commissioning of the Apostle Paul. That's the one I hold to. And there are reasons why. The Acts 11 is with the establishment of the church in Antioch where first, they were first called Christians. And so some mid-Acts people think that starts in Acts 11. The other was in Acts 13, 2, where the Spirit says, separate me now, Paul and Barnabas, you know, for this, you know, that first journey, you know, that I've called them to make. 
And so a lot of people say, oh, it's not until then that, you know, the, the body of Christ begins. I actually do think it's Acts 9 because I believe Saul is the first member of the body of Christ. And, and again, I'm not going to go into that. There's a number of reasons that I think that. The one thing that they all have in common, however, is that they all believe that the body of Christ, that, that the body of Christ started under the ministry of the Apostle Paul before he wrote his first epistle. They do have that in common. Okay. And then, of course, um, okay, so let's just get ourselves back uh, to 1 Corinthians. There's an Acts 28, by the way. So is it the Acts 2 deal? Then you have mid-Acts, and then you have Acts 28. Okay, I don't need to explain those. Uh, so here we go. Back to 1 Corinthians, and let's take a look at verse 9. Oh, I had it on the PowerPoint. Look at that. Acts 11 with this, okay, and separate me. Okay. I'm sorry, I got this off the Internet. I had no idea it was on there. Okay. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither been in the heart of man, the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them, those all things, unto us, uh, Paul and the Apostle Prophets, by his Spirit. For the sp Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Um, oh, i got to keep going. Sorry. No wonder I got lost. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now in this passage, Paul is revealing those three steps of how God made known the mystery. That be revelation, illumination, inspiration. All right. And so verse 9, let's just focus on that verse just for a moment. So he says, but as it's written, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things God had prepared for them that love him. When I got ordained, it was a church up in North Louisiana. It was the church, actually, that I came up in as a, as a, a college-age person. I was in their college and career department. And there was about six of us guys who were going into the ministry. We all got licensed. And then at some point, the church was going to ordain us. And so there's a council that you have to go through and men ask you questions to make sure that you actually kind of know what you're talking about before they put their stamp of approval on you. And a friend of mine, Steve Petty, was a member of that church. He'd come up in that church as well, and his dad was one of the deacons. And as an ordained deacon, he was sitting on that council. And he asked Steve, he said, I've got a question for my son. Tell me what heaven is like. And so Steve, you know, he's given this answer of what he thinks heaven is like, and his dad cut him off and quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. This is the thing that almost everybody thinks is talking about heaven. Eye hath not seen, and ear hath not heard, and neither have been in the heart of man the things that... You don't know what heaven's like, boy. You know, Paul said you don't know, and he's doing that. And I thought, boy, I'm sure glad he asked Steve, because I would have probably given the same answer he gave. And, you know, he got that. And now, and now, you're saying, now that you know what that's about, what would your answer be? I would be going, ask Steve. Uh, because I'm thinking, we don't have long enough for me to, okay. What Paul is talking about here. Now, he is talking about the things, but these things have to do not with heaven, but with, they're the things of, not, well, well, okay, that's where it's going on. But what are the things he's going to reveal to Paul here? It's the things of the mystery, right? It's the things of the mystery. Not the things of the third heaven. It's the things of the mystery. Okay, so, all right, now where are we at? 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Okay. And, and now, let's take up Carolyn's point. It is the things of the mystery, and Paul is making the point here that, that the facts of the mystery, the truth of the mystery, cannot be understood. I'm just going to say it because he says, I have not seen. Let me just do that one. Cannot be understood by anything you make an observation of. There's nothing you can see. There's nothing you can look at that would inform you about the mystery. The second part of that is, uh, I have not seen and ear hath not heard. And now we're talking about 
rational logic or argument. There is nothing you could hear that would have clued you in about the mystery. So there's no scientific observation. There's no philosophical argument that would tell you about the mystery. Neither have entered into the heart of man. And that means either by, and let me just put the heart up here, not your imagination and not faith in some belief. None of that, no matter how that gets into your heart, none of that will qualify you to know the things of the mystery or any of the deep things of God, right? Okay, so you got both of those things working there. Paul's point is that there's only one way for us to know about the things of the mystery, and that's that it has to come from God Himself. Okay, now when God Himself reveals things which men otherwise could not know, we call that divine revelation. That's the definition of that. Now verse 10. But God hath revealed them, those things of the mystery, or the deep things of God, hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit... Well, let's just do that first phrase. God hath revealed them. So divine revelation, that's what Paul is talking about. Otherwise, we wouldn't know about it. Remember, nothing you've ever seen or heard or has entered into your heart. So how does God do that? By His Spirit. And that's what He said here. God hath revealed them unto us. In fact, let me just give you the next deal to highlight the, the part. God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. The Spirit of God can reveal the things of God because God's Spirit searches the deep things of God. Does the Spirit of God know what's going on that God has kept a secret all along? Of course, of course. Okay, so Paul's going to explain this by using how things work in us as an illustration. So verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Now we talked about that, but it's in that same way. In other words, he's saying the only one that knows what you're thinking is you. Well, the only one that knows what God th God's thinking is God. So he does that. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Why in the world would he be going to all of this trouble to explain this unless Paul is giving a defense of the truthfulness of this message of the mystery which is so unlike anything they have ever heard before you know if he doesn't give some kind of an explanation. People will just reject that as if a guy walked up here and said, God's no longer dealing with y'all the way you think, so he revealed it to me. And you'd go, you know, get the bum out of here. Well, that's the way they would have treated Paul. So now he's explaining this process. So where are we? Verse 11. Okay. That is what verse 10 was talking about when he said but God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit. God has revealed what is in His mind to Paul and the grace, apostles, and prophets. He revealed it to them by His Spirit. And as we know from verse 9, revelation does not come from men's philosophy or scientific observation. It comes directly from the Spirit of God. Now, verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So in verse 12, Paul's going to talk about the next step in the process of taking the things which are only in the mind of God, that He alone knows, and not only getting Paul to understand them, but getting them written down on paper so that the rest of the body of Christ can do what? Read and understand Paul's knowledge in the mystery. That's how that is going to happen. Okay, so here in verse 12, before Paul tells us how inspiration takes place, he's going to do just like he did earlier. He's going to tell us how it doesn't take place. So here we are. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. That's how it doesn't take place, right? And we talked about what is, what is the spirit of the world. You can have whatever opinion you want about what that is. It doesn't matter. That's not how it happened. Okay? Nothing to do with that. So what do we have so far? We have the revealing of the things of God that can only come through the Spirit of God. 
So the progression is revelation. God, the Holy Spirit, gives Paul or the apostles and prophets a revelation. This is the act that puts forth the truth into Paul's mind. Now, I'm pointing at my brain, but I don't mean brain, okay? I just don't know exactly where the mind is. I think mine's probably in my left foot. But anyway, at this point, Paul may or may not understand the exact word to use to communicate the thing that is being revealed to him by the Spirit. And then inspiration. Now the Spirit will use inspiration. And this is where the Spirit helps Paul choose the right words out of his vocabulary. Take a look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. In other words, Paul's being clear. What, what, what is being revealed to me is not something that a man can figure out. I mean, that's what I look at when I see that. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, which says to me that the Spirit of God is directly involved in this part of the process. He's the one instructing. Do you see that? I mean, to me, that looks pretty plain. Okay, so he says, uh, so Paul says that he and those apostles and prophets by the way, doesn't that kind of conjure up something that was back over there? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right. So, you know what? Which things also we speak, what are those things, Paul? Those which the Holy Ghost teacheth. See, I look at that and I say the Holy Ghost is the one, the Spirit of God is the one communicating the revelation to Paul, communicating to his mind, he's discerning what's his thoughts and what's not, what's God's thoughts. And then the Spirit is taken over from there. And here comes the last part of it right here, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, I always heard as a young preacher boy, and I believed it for many years, that that verse was talking about how you study the Bible. That you compared spiritual things with spiritual, which meant... You found a reference in one part of your Bible and you ran a reference to a similar thing in another book or another chapter and you kept lining up those references. And so you were comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So I just one verse with another verse. That's how I got taught that in Bible college and that's what was in my head. But look, and, and by the way, that may have some value if you rightly divide the word. But those guys that taught me did not rightly divide the Word. So they were comparing things back there in the Old Testament with things in Paul's epistles with things in the book of Revelation. And that made a very complicated theology because those things seemed to run counter to each other. All right. And so comparing spiritual things with spiritual, I understand that to mean that the Spirit of God, because He's the one that's teaching Going from the previous verse, the things which the Holy Ghost teacheth, right? Means that the Spirit helped Paul take those spiritual things about the mystery that are being communicated to him and find corresponding, remember compare, equal, things that are equal or of equal standing. So the Spirit is saying, here's the thing I'm showing you now, let's go into your vocabulary and find a comparable word to describe the thoughts that are going on in your mind that you know are from me, the Spirit of God. Does that make sense? Do you at least follow that? Okay. Because now, now, the Spirit is going to help him do that. I, here's what I'm seeing. The Spirit is involved in this whole process from start to finish. And so that next step is to write those words down so they can be seen and read by all. But listen, the inspiration is not in the writing. I think that's a mistake. You do realize Paul didn't do the writing on all of his epistles. But the words that the guy, whoever's writing it down 
the words he's writing down are the ones Paul is speaking. By the way, did you remember what that previous verse said? Which things also we speak. He didn't say which we write. Paul didn't write all of them. But it's the speak. So it's all happening with Paul. You, you see this, right? So the Spirit is saying, okay, here's the truth. I'm going to make it evident in your mind. You know this is not your thoughts, but these are mine. So Paul, have confidence in this. This is not, I do this all the time. I come, I'm doing this lesson. I'm doing this lesson. I'm totally convinced of what I'm telling you. Because I see a half a dozen other places now where all of this dovetails in there perfectly and now I understand things I didn't understand before. So for me, that's kind of a confirmation. But you know what I know? The Spirit of God didn't just put that in my spirit, make it apparent in my mind, and then make sure I could discern what was from Him and what is my thought about it. So when I teach this lesson, this is inspired teaching. Okay, this is where you go, oh no, Brother Mike, it is. Okay, you know better. Okay, so you get, you, you, thank you, Luli. Okay, all right. But you get, you get what I'm saying here. Okay, now, there is more to say about this, but this is all, th I'm, I'm through with this for now because we're going to have other opportunities to be able to do more things with this. So I want to go back to what I told you we would do in the beginning. Go back to verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor hath not heard, neither entered into the heart of man what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Uh, I'm sorry, prepare for them that love him. This is a reference to Isaiah 64, 4. And I want to show you this passage. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear Neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. You notice that part is different? What did Paul say? For them that love him. Here he said, for him that waiteth for him. And I want to put verse 5 on here to show you. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy way. What's really going on here? And we didn't read the whole chapter or the chapter 4 to get a context. He's talking about the glory of the kingdom. The kingdom has been promised and God is saying, this thing is so great and so glorious and so wondrous. You cannot imagine. There's nothing you've ever heard. There's nothing you've ever seen. You, you can't even imagine what this is going to be like. And then when he talks about for those that work righteousness and remember thee in their ways, and what he's actually fixed to introduce here is, and I have something very special prepared for them that are actually doing that. Okay, I just wanted to throw that in there. I know people get all... Okay, I hear, I hear that. Hold, please. So I want to say Ephesians chapter 2. I could be wrong, but let me just get all these pages kind of stick together. Give me just a second. I think I want to say Ephesians chapter 2. If I don't find this in just a second, we'll just continue. That may not be 2, but let me just look. Okay, so I, I, I do see one of the verses that I'm after. So if you got your Bible, turn over to Ephesians 2, because I don't have this on the PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to see if I can find this other one. Give me just a second. Um... No, I'm not going to find the other one. Man, that's what I get for doing this off the top of my head. Maybe it's Ephesians 3. Let me just peruse this really quickly here. Grant you, let's see. Grant you, Paul, have desire you think of boldness. 
eternal purpose, the intent, and the calling of the saints and all saints. No, just look in Ephesians chapter 2 and look with me in verse 9. He's going to say, he's coming to come out of verse 8 that says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's not works in order to be saved. You understand? That's what you've been created unto, those works that you should. That's your sanctified life. That's a different thing. The only reason I bring that up is because sometimes the folks who have an argument against us say, well, they're bringing works into it. Well, I'm sorry, Paul did. You should probably take that up with him. Um, of course, but not to be saved, you understand. And by the way, let me just make a statement about this. When God looks at you because you are in Christ, He look, there are some days I feel like I do pretty good, probably not as good as I think I do. And then there are other days where I go, boy, I didn't handle that very well at all. God does not look at me at the end of that day and go, yeah, you really messed up today. I'm a little disappointed in you. You know why? Because He is looking at me in Christ and not based on what I do or don't do. So you, you, you have to understand this. God, there is nothing you can do tomorrow that will make God love you more in Christ than He does today. Nothing. And there's nothing you can do tomorrow to make Him love you less. And that is a blessed promise. And if you really get that in your inner man and you can live out of that, someone says, but, but what you're doing is you're saying to people, well, if it doesn't matter, what then? Shall we continue in sin? I'm going to quote Romans here. You're saying you're giving us a license to sin. No, I'm not. I'm giving you the power to live out of grace. That's what that's doing. This is not about... Yeah, because otherwise, guess what? You put yourself under a performance system again. Guess, welcome back to the law, O oh ye Galatians. Isn't that right? Yeah, you don't want to do that. And that's the hard thing. I'm, can I just, look, I got a minute here, so let me just do it. And so that's the thing. I'm, I work really hard instead of looking at people based on what they do, I work really hard now to look at them on who they are in Christ and value and esteem them on that basis. And I mean to the point where, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about them this way, but that's not how I really think. Let me tell you, I can give you a testimony. The doctrine will change that to where now you really don't have to fake it till you make it. That's just a bogus way of counterfeiting it. This is talking about really changing you and how you're thinking so that your thinking begins to line up with your Heavenly Father's. Here's the thing. We want to think about them the way they deserve to be thought about, but we want God to think about us as we are in Christ. Don't think about me that way. Sorry. Everybody in the body of Christ, this is how God is looking at you. What, is He oblivious to what they're doing? Of course not. But the way he feels, he, ha, he has to do that because if, if you don't have that position with him, you don't, then you will not be able to live out of that so that you can become that in function. He has to give you everything positionally so that you can achieve it in function. Otherwise, you're just producing it in the energy of your flesh and you can never do that. It has to be out of what he has done. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't have that other verse. It's really a lot better than that. But anyway, I'll just, l let me just continue on here. So Isaiah is talking about this. And so the point to that last thing is, that last part is not a blanket promise to everybody in the kingdom. It's for those who met a standard of behavior. Now at the end of verse 4 where he says, nobody's heard or seen or thought about, but you know, except for God, what he prepared for him that waiteth for him. What does that mean? What does it mean, him that waiteth for him? And I'm going to tell you that is a way of saying who trust in God. In other words, there is a promise of this glorious kingdom. What were they always asking? When Jesus died, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? When are we going to do this? You know what he's saying? 
him that waiteth. In other words, patient trust in the promise without getting all antsy and anxious about it. I think that's the thing that's going on there. The glories of the kingdom. By the way, that's what Romans 9, 4 talks about. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth. He's got a whole series of things here, but the thing I'm highlighting is the glory. Because that's what's going on back there in Isaiah. And by the way, you say, well, did Israel really have a glory? It reaches zenith. It was just the hem of the garment, but it reaches zenith under Solomon. Under Solomon, the, the stories went out of the kingdom in Israel in such a way that the queen of Sheba comes to look for herself. We have a hymn about it in our old hymn books. And the name of that hymn is the half has ne'er been told. Because that's what she says in the Old Testament when she comes over there and she looks at that and she goes, I heard how great this was and I didn't believe it. I came over to see for myself and truly the half has not been told to me. Now, if that's what the world thought about the kingdom and then God says, I know you've seen that, but the truth is there isn't anything you've ever seen or heard that will tell you how glorious this really is. Now you say, well, why are you telling us that? Because the glories of that kingdom cannot hold a candle to the glory of the riches of Christ. That's what the body of Christ gets. So if you say, well, I wish I was in the kingdom, why would you want to take a step down? You not only get everything that was promised to them, I mean in that spiritual sense, but you get stuff they don't get. Now I'm just saying, this is a glorious thing. A glorious thing, and I wanted to make that point. Okay. God did not... Anyway, there's a whole deal. You can read your notes about that. So I need to get to these last couple of verses. So 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Nobody's ever heard about the thing that God has prepared for them that love Him. That phrase ought to have conjured this up in your mind. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. How about one more 2 Timothy 4, Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. See how this is the phrase that Paul uses and it keeps coming up? By the way, you realize this is about the judgment seat of Christ. How do we know that? First of all, He is the righteous judge. And for you and me, as members of the body of Christ, that's the one we'll, we're not going to the great white throne judgment. Ours is going to take place at the Bema. And he says, and shall give me at that day. What day? That, that, that day of judgment, okay? And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. You say, oh yeah, I'm looking forward to the blessed hope. He's not, he's not referring, look, he's going to appear at the blessed hope, but do you understand what he's doing? He's coming to get us to take us to the judgment seat of Christ. That, there are issues about the judgment seat of Christ that are, a terror. And in fact, Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But that is not meant, it's not terror in the sense, oh, you're going to lose your salvation or any of that kind of stuff. You realize you have to have what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ in order for you to be in the heavenly places for eternity as a free moral agent with the idea that you will never sin against God again. You can say, well, it's going to be perfect up there and you know, it's not going to be an opportunity to sin. It, what do you think it was when Lucifer rebelled? Yeah. What, you, 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 you thought he was on Canal Street in New Orleans? No, it's up there. It's up there where God was. There wasn't any of that up there. He was a free... Look, here's always the problem. God cannot reproduce Himself. You understand that? He's eternal. If He created anything, it would not be from everlasting... It would be a created. See, he's not created. So he cannot reproduce himself. But what he does do is he gives man certain what we call communicable attributes. They are things that he himself possesses so he can make us in his image. So what does it mean? Now, does that mean we get every attribute of God? No, you don't get omnipotence and you don't get om omnipresence and you, you, know, you don't get all of that. But what is the number one communicable attribute of God? Free will. Free will. By the way, 
That's the thing that makes our love and devotion and loyalty to Him mean something because we choose to do it. If He makes you do it, there's no glory in that. If He strips away... So here's the problem. If you create creatures that are not God because He is perfectly righteous, is it possible for God to commit unrighteousness? No, it's not. Can God be unjust? Not for a moment. It's because of who He is. But when He creates creatures with a free will that are not God, and they can't be, there is always the risk that they're going to sin. So how is He going to solve that? Two things. First one is at the judgment seat of Christ. That's not an embarrassment. That is supposed to show you something. That's, I believe, what the terror of the Lord is. I believe you're going to get a firsthand look at how your sin made an impact in this world when you thought it was negligible. I believe we're all going to get that look because I don't think we understand that. And I believe that is the reason that evil exists in this world and God allowed it to exist because He is teaching you the lesson this is what rebellion against me produces. Do you like that? Do you like atrocities? Do you like the abuse of children? Do you like these kinds of things? Well, guess where that come from? That didn't come from righteousness. That came from unrighteousness. That came from sin. That came from evil. And God is saying, if you don't like that stuff, look, I don't like it either, but you've got to learn at some point that you've got to quit doing what you want to do because you're creating this thing. He said, I don't believe I have any part in that. Well, at the judgment seat, we'll see. But I'm convinced that this is what's going on there. And then there's a second thing that's going to go on, and that is the relationship that you're going to have with Jesus Christ in eternity. And I'm talking about the personal relationship, the one whereby you will finally see Him for who He is. Because I believe this, that back when it was just the Godhead, God looks at His Son, and He is so pleased with His Son. By the way, He hasn't died on the cross yet. You understand, He hasn't created the world yet. But he looks at his son and he's so pleased with his son. He goes, you know what? I want to have a family and I want them to all to be like my son. So guess what the goal is for us? To be conformed to the image of his son. Why? So that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God wants that kind of a family to fill that up. And that's what he's trying to do. And I believe that in eternity that you are going to get to spend time with the Lord. I think God looks at His Son and says, if, if you really knew Him the way I know Him, you would love Him more than anything in the universe. And you're going to get that chance in eternity. So when you see what evil produces at the judgment seat, even the smallest rebellion, which by the way, the Scripture says, is as the sin of witchcraft. We like to undersell that one. Once you see that for what it really is, and then suddenly, you know what? You have a relationship with the Lord Jesus that has been cultivated. By the way, I believe He will take the initiative in that because of His position. And when He does, I think you will feel about Him in such a way that if you are ever presented with the opportunity to be lifted up with pride or to rebel in any way against God, you would look at that and you would say, I will never, ever betray Him. And I believe that that will be that. Because God's not, God's not taking away your free will. But if you choose to never go back to that based on what you know about sin and how you feel about Him, that glorifies God. That shows it to be. And look, that happened in the... Do you remember when the Pharisees... They, I can't remember where this was, Carson, but... You know, they sent these young guys and they were like, go over there and hassle Jesus while he's teaching. I kind of remember where that was. And so they go over there and when they come back, you know, they kind of question, they go, well, what went on? And they went, man, we never heard anybody talk like this guy. And they're like, oh, get out of here. You guys are worthless. We sent you over there to disrupt and you went over there and got all enamored with it. Look, I think that's just a little picture 
of what it's going to be like in eternity. Look, I said the story, and I know everybody thought, yeah, okay, he had a stroke in 2017. Just forgive him. He's a senile. Look, I'm going to tell you what. One day, one day in eternity, the Lord Jesus is going to come into your presence, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to look at you, Francis, and he's going to say, I want to tell you how much you mean to me. And when he gets through doing that, and he's talking to you about the things that you're going to do together with him, when he walks away from that, you know what? You're going to be thinking, I've never known anybody like that. And if the time ever came that a, any kind of presentation to be disloyal to him were to come up, you would never do it. By the way, we already do those kinds of things. We already, we already do those kinds of things. There are th I have the free will to do it, I will never jab my eye out with this pen. <laughs> you know why? Because I know what the consequences are. Once you learn the consequences of sin, no one will have to, Tracy never has to call me up and go, Dad, please don't jab your eye out with a pen today. She doesn't have to do that because I've already, I've already decided I am never going to do that. So there's the judgment seat. And that's what we're talking about here. Them that love is appearing. Okay, let me get back to it. Okay, thanks for letting me chase a rabbit. I just want to get into this. But now, what I need us to do, because I'm going to take off on the 2 Timothy 4 thing here real quick. Even though we're not over here studying 2 Timothy yet, think about what we have read before in connection with Ephesians 1.15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, and Ephesians 6.17. Do you remember what that was? Faith, in other words, we talked about the breastplate. Remember he, he talked about the breastplate, can I just breathe it, of righteousness. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, it defined what that was. The breastplate of faith and love. And I defined for you what I believe that was. Because it has to be something in Paul's epistle prior to when you get over to Ephesians 1.15 because they already have it. When I, when I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints, I thank God for you. They already had it. Well, what's the only thing they had prior to that? The Romans' doctrine. So it had to be something that they learned back there. So what is their faith in the Lord Jesus? Not talking about saving faith. He was with them for three years. He already knew that. He, when I heard that you guys got saved. Come on, he already knew they were saved. So what is the faith? It is faith in what the Lord Jesus revealed to Paul about the mystery. Because that was a different message. So if you're, and you say, well, if they had faith in the Lord in what he revealed to Paul in the mystery, what are they doing? That means they understand the mystery, they defend the mystery, and they publish the mystery. Love unto all the saints. That one's pretty, pretty plain. You know where we got that? By the way, where'd this one come from? Romans chapter 16. Your love unto all the saints, where is that? That's Romans chapter 12, verse 3, to chapter 14, verse 7. And that's those five core features of godly love that we learned over there. He said, when I heard you had this, and I learned you had this, then you know what? I know that you, have, you now have the breastplate of righteousness. That's a piece of armor. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous God, give, give me at that day. So I got to thinking about this, and I thought, okay. So if righteousness, by the way, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he talks about the breastplate of faith and love. But in Ephesians 6, he calls that same thing the breastplate of righteousness. So evidently, righteousness is the mystery and godly love toward the saints. That's what that piece of armor is. And he calls that righteousness. But then he says up here at the judgment seat, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And here's what occurs to me. 
If this is working in you, you have the breastplate. And if you have the breastplate, that crown is already laid up. Because, I know it's not a physical thing, but just let me say it in an anthropomorphic style so that we can understand it. When you get up there at the judgment, isn't everything, I mean, you get up there and you're going out to, I mean, guess what? Your battles are over, aren't they? Do you still need armor? No. No. You don't need armor anymore. I mean, is there enemies that we're going to fight? People ask me, if all this is supposed to translate into training for eternity, are there, are there battles we're going to fight up there that God just hasn't told us about? No. You know what's going to happen? <laughs> You're going to trade in your armor for a crown. Now, is that a principle in the Bible? Well, it sure is. Because at the end of the millennium, after they've all rebelled against the Lord and He put them all down, at the end of Armageddon, you know what they do? They beat their plowshares into yeah, swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They're just trading one end for the other, right? You don't need armor anymore. The fighting is over. But you get a crown. But wait, if you're wearing a crown, that means you must be reigning with Him. Uh-oh. Isn't that what He said? If we suffer, we shall reign with Him. And so, if you're going to reign with Him, and by the way, this is a crown of righteousness. I need to wait until we get over here to discuss this fully. But I think that actually tells you the particular kind of reigning that you're going to be doing in the heavenly places. So, if you've got the breastplate, the crown is laid up. How do you think Paul would have known to say that? See, I think there's a connection here because they're both called righteousness. That's what they're both called. So if you're saying, I'd sure like to have that breastplate when I go to you know, battle against the adversary. By the way, you do understand, if the breastplate is right, do you know what this is meant to be armor against? Putting you back in Israel's program. If it's about the mystery... This is the armor that keeps you from being affected by the attack that tries to put you back under the law in Israel's program. And what is this? Love unto all the saints? It keeps you from being a jerk. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, this is your conduct, right? If you've got those two working and they both come out of Romans, you've got the breastplate. Because that's what Thessalonians calls it, the breastplate of faith and love. And then when Paul's over there in Ephesians 1.15, he says, And when I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love unto all the saints. And boy, when I read that in 1 Thessalonians, I thought, wait a minute, that's Ephesians language. And when you put all that together, now I'm, I'm just looking at this. And so, if, and if you think about what righteousness is, and you say, okay, we're going to reign with him. In what particular way are we going to be reigning? Just think about what those are. We'll talk about it when we get over to Timothy. Okay, so next week, I'm just going to tell you this. I have another reveal for you. And that is going to be on the helmet of salvation. I did a little piece of that on, at, in Monaghan's, but I said, this is, just, this is just the first part of it. That's all this is. The really good part, we do here next time. And I can't wait to show you this because every piece of the armor is now, now you're going to look at it and you're going to go, I know exactly where in the Scripture that comes from. I know if I've got that or not because I know if that doctrine is working in me or not. And then you're also going to know exactly what attack that is supposed to protect you from. And when you get the whole armor on, guess what? You're ready, right? I mean, I think it's great. Like I've wrestled with this armor stuff for so long and I've heard everybody talk about one thing and another, oh, I can't wait to show it to you. You'll either like it or you won't. But anyway, I like it. So, All right, let's have a word of prayer. And this is the end. Of, no, I do need to say one last thing. Sorry. If you're listening to these uh, sessions and you're not sure that if you died today where you would spend eternity, we do care about you and we want you to know that you can have Jesus as your Savior. If you'll call us toll free and here's, here's the numbers, right? Here's the phone number and here's the email. And if you'll contact us, look, we'll, we can send you a link to a video that you can watch and know exactly how you can know that you have eternal life. 
If you'd like to talk to somebody personally, we can do that too. Now, if you're already saved, but you're thinking, boy, there has to be more to my Christian life than what I've got going on, let us help you with that too. If you'll just contact us, we'd be glad to make available to you free of charge Bible studies that will literally change your life. So let us do that. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, I pray that the things that we've looked at today here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 would bolster our confidence in how this whole revelation and inspiration, how all that gets transmitted and how the Spirit overlooked that whole procedure and we can have real confidence in your word. Not that it came from anywhere, but from your mind through your spirit to, in this case, the Apostle Paul, who discerned what the Spirit was teaching him from the things in his own mind and then was assisted by the Spirit in using his own vocabulary to accurately put forward those truths. And we can have real confidence in it, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you all for being here. I appreciate you and love you.